often the material that seminary draws me into causes me to walk on perilous ground, often ground as thin as ice covering the surface of a frozen lake. I say this because modern theology often dives into the margins, into areas of controversy, areas of polarizing attitudes in light of issues surrounding race, gender, and the political philosophies that define our present times. This is certainly true of the African-American authors who I have been asked to comment on earlier, and it is also true of black womanist theologian Jacqueline Grant, who has offered a thesis that I will briefly provide a summary of here and then offer some short commentary on. Her thesis could be presented as follows, that feminist theologians often claim to speak in Grant's view for the experience of all women everywhere, but that many of these are coming from a supposedly affluent, privileged, white background of experience compared to that of black women, who historically, in Grant's view, have suffered a radically different experience because of subjugation in light of slavery, where they were seen as subhuman property by white women who served as, in air quotes, their mistresses or slave owners, and afterwards, in light of their role as domestic servants and workers and laborers in the Jim Crow and segregation era only finally to be offered a voice in the public square in light of increased recognition, although there is still oppression to this day. Therefore, in Grant's view, I'm just summarizing her arguments here, uh, as a result, only now can there be a classification of a womanist African-American theologian voice that is distinct from that of larger uh, theological Voices of Feminism. This is particularly perilous ground, as I am indeed a white, a Caucasian uh, male, very much studying to be a, in some sense, a spiritual leader as a pastor, uh, a voice for the flock of God, which, according to Scripture, is represented in Revelation uh, as consisting of all tribes, tongues, nations, ethnicities, and backgrounds. And therefore, I am aware of how the institutional church has failed miserably to accurately represent all the voices of God's children. And this is true not only for women generally, but for the unique experiences of those marginalized communities um, of whom the world would rather turn away and, and not necessarily have to confront. So I'm aware that the experience of African-American women is distinct uniquely in light of the systematic forms of oppression compared to that of others. I'm, I fully recognize that, and I think that this article is important on the part of Jacqueline Grant. This being said, I do have some concerns, and they do come from the reality that as I was reading this article, is this is a class in Christology, the study of Jesus. Uh, the person of Jesus appeared very rarely in the article I was asked to read. I'm not saying that Jesus appeared nowhere in the article. But ultimately, if we are to be focused primarily on the person of Christ and the ministry of Christ, while Jacqueline Grant does point out in a, a section of her article that there is a need to point to the historical Jesus, who is a liberator and is one with the oppressed, and African Americans are particularly oppressed, and African American women are particularly oppressed, and therefore Jesus is in unique solidarity with African American women. Uh, while that is something that is presented, and I, I see this as a very valid form of theological argument that is definitely moving and should be discussed, Ultimately, my concern is summed up in a statement, I believe, in that section of the paper, where she states primarily that the historical Jesus was a politi political liberator. And this was 
throwing alarm bells off in my mind, because ultimately, if I read the New Testament correctly, if I read the New Testament in its own historical context, the historical Jesus is saying, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and to God that which is God's. I see Jesus saying in the text of Scripture that we are to love our enemies and to turn the other cheek. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. did render this as a way of life, not so much a political tactic, but it was used in a political fashion. And there are political ramifications for what a lifestyle of radical self-sacrificial love can carry out. But I would severely challenge, severely challenge Grant's uh, thesis that the ministry of Jesus, therefore, could be seen as one of political liberation, when in reality, Jesus triumphs over the kingdoms of this world and over the systematic forms of oppression for all people and over the power of Satan, the instigator of peace, and sin and death itself by liberating us into the new Jerusalem and the kingdom of God. Like I said, this doesn't mean for a single moment that the kingdom of God has no earthly ramifications. Oh, it absolutely does. The birth of the kingdom of God is what led to the abolition of slavery. The radical voices in the abolitionist movement were Christian voices. It was the introduction of the gospel that led to the elevation of women in society as seen as being made equally in the image and likeness of God. That is a Christian concept in origin, according to Tom Holland, author of the book Dominion, about the rise of Christianity, and many other theologians. Now, whether you believe that thesis or not is up to debate, but I personally do hold to the argument that says that the arrival of Christianity and the idea of the imago dei, the image of God, radically transformed the world's perception of civil rights. The idea of civil rights, I believe, uh, comes from a uniquely Judeo-Christian understanding of Imago Dei. And that would include women in that understanding of the Imago Dei. Not, and I repeat, not as inferior, but as co-equal members of God's creation. Now, whether we're going to get into egalitarian versus complementarian understandings of what that equality looks like, is not the subject of this recording. But ultimately, I've been asked to comment on this, and my, my concern is that the person of, Je of Jesus and the reality of the spiritual power and imminence of Christ is lost in light of these very real social hurts and very real social struggles. And uh, my concern is that we become so fixated on these areas of contemporary woundedness, which is a valid area of investigation and isn't some merely armchair theological speculation, but it is the real lived out experience of women and men to this day who are forgotten by society and the culture, the modern day lepers, the modern day tax collectors. And we do need to reach out in authentic solidarity. However, my concern is, is it possible that we're so busy about the business of the king that we forget the king? Is it so possible that we find ourselves so fixated on areas of social justice for all justice is social, that we forget that we are to be authors not merely of a political philosophy or a movement, but instead to be representatives of the risen Jesus on earth? I mean, my desire to give alms, my desire to spend time with those who are disenfranchised to be a voice of justice or open ears listening to their testimony or to be a voice for change in my community doesn't come from my desire to bring about a utopia on earth based off of our own skill or merit. That would be Pelagian. It would be works righteousness. Instead, I believe that because I am a redeemed person, because my soul has been saved, Therefore, in love, I want to offer this kind of love on earth as it is in heaven, bearing good fruit by being a voice for change and healing in the world as a result of my redeemed 
relationship with Jesus. And it is Christocentric. Not focused merely on the here and now. So I just, I have no issues with uh, womanist or black feminist theologians uh, offering their points of view. I think that they're very fascinating. And I certainly, as a white male author, need to definitely take into account my own biases and perspectives. And my experiences as a blind, visually impaired theologian, I need to take into account those voices. And the church certainly has a ministry to those who are on the margins, uh, which would include me as a visually impaired individual. This being said, um, I'm worried whether the accent isn't enough on Jesus. And while he is in our neighbor, whatever you did to the least of these brothers and sisters, you did also unto me, Matthew 25. While he is indeed in and among the oppressed, uh, I want to point to the empty tomb. I want to turn to the promise of the New Jerusalem, not to the neglect of social concerns, but uh, towards the the hopeful accenting on God's redeeming love in the middle of our present suffering. So I hope that's been a balanced critique, and I hope this opinion has been interesting.